Um, I won't get into that too much because Joe kind of already talked to you about, about the history. Um, so if, if there's one thing you take home from today's presentation, it's that I like pictures on my slides, okay? So just one thing, I like pictures on my slides, if that's it. Um, so this, this is a picture of our, our home dairy that, uh, that I was born and raised on. Um, that, that, oh, I'm kind of, um, uh, it's a double 25 parallel. Uh, we installed the uh, AFI program in there in 2005. We also have AFI lab there. Uh, that is the main feed center. And uh, overall, there's about 2,000 cows on site, and that, that dairy does supply our methane digester. Um, and all the, all the feed for that dairy and the robots uh, is coming from, from this facility. So, so a lot of my comparisons between, that I get to later between the robots and the conventional is going to be comparing this double 25 parallel to our 36 robots. So this is our third dairy. We purchased a legacy dairy in 2007. It was a double eight. We converted it and added the barn there that you see, uh, the bigger barn. We added that in 2010. So we're currently milking about 700 only first lactation animals. Part of the reason why it, you know, it's only first lactation is because it's 13 miles away. And so we want cows that are going to stay and not, if, if anything's treated, it comes back. So we, we thought we'd, we'd be better off with younger cows up there it's also the parlor's a little bit smaller, so the, the, the smaller framed first lactation animals fit in a lot better there. And um, so that's, that's kind of how we run, run the dairies. And so um, since we started the robots, cows, when they calve, all the, the calving pen is in the robots. Um, and then they'll either go to the main dairy or stay in the robots. So there's no fresh animals here at this facility. So they just milk cows there. So here's a picture of the methane digester that we talked about. Uh, we're currently running between eight and 900 kilowatts an hour um, between the two engines. And so that's been, that's been really um, a neat thing to think of that pretty much uh, the southern half of our, our town of Plymouth, we're, we're providing them with, with their electricity. So the auto feeder barns, it, it was kind of dumb luck um, that we did this before the robots. Which, which gave us really good information comparing a calf raised in a hutch versus an auto feeder and how they transition into the robots. Um, but we, we, were, we were kind of, uh, we needed to do something different with our calf operation because uh, Indiana changed their animal unit laws and we were required to either collect all the rainwater, not allow the calf outside of a hutch or put them in a barn. So after a lot of touring, we decided we were gonna put them in a barn and um, and like I said, so when we started in the robots last year, the first heifers we were calving in were raised in hutches. And we really struggled with them early on getting them to go to the robot. But as soon as we started raising calves, or freshening in calves that were raised in the auto feeder barn, that problem went away. By, by three weeks, two thirds of them are coming in on their own. And even now this year, I've got some room in my robot barn. And the only second lactation cows I'm putting in are ones that were raised in the auto feeder. And, and the second lactation cows who've never seen a robot, in that first week, I'm getting over half of them coming into the robot on their own. So the auto feeder is, is a great, uh, and, and the similarities between how you run an auto feeder versus robots, it's, they're, they're almost identical. And how you manage them, you can manage them almost, almost uh, the same. So the robotic dairy. Uh, so for those of you that haven't been there, this is kind of uh, the layout. This is a 3D image. Uh, it's a flat roof, so it's the first uh, barn of its kind. Um, it's a commercial building. So the, the, there is like 1% slope from the center to the outside, but that's both on the roof and the concrete. So there's a consistent 16 feet inside the barn. And then you can see the fan wall, and we're running three robots in a pen. Uh, six robots in each robot room. And so our pen sizes are, you know, our, our first goal was, well, first target was 180. And then when we got there, of course, all farmers, let's, let's see how much we can push it. Uh, we, we got a couple of our heifer pens up to 200. And at that point, you felt like maybe you were starting to see some negative effects there. Uh, but at that point, you're talking 65 cows per robot. Um, so we were not, uh, you know, it, 
we were very comfortable at, at keeping it around 63 cows per robot and, and not seeing any, any side effects or negative effects to that. Um, one of the other things we've got is, I don't know if there's a pointer. No. Um, the robots, there's a little separation pin here. So one of the things that we did when we'd made the decision, and actually I think that's the next slide. And what did I do? Yeah. Well, I don't think that, what, I must have stopped the presentation. There we go, resume. There we go. All right, why robots? So, it, you know, it was kind of a dream of mine when I came back to the farm in 2003. You know, you saw the overhead picture of our, our other parlor. You know, it was built over 30 years. Wherever you could fit a barn is where you put a barn. It wasn't very efficient. And at that time, you know, we're milking 3,200 cows on, on three facilities, which is, you know, about the same number of cows you can milk on a rotary, but we've got double the labor. So we knew if we wanted to stay competitive in the industry, we needed to do something. And you know, our first thoughts were, well, let's put in a rotary. You know, that's what everybody's doing. And I remember it was about two weeks after World Dairy Expo in 2015, uh, a friend of mine said, you really ought to take a look at these robots. Because I remember that because in 2015, I walked by all the, all the robot booths. And I'm like, eh, that's not for us. So we started talking about the reasons why. Labor, of course. Uh, labor's hard to find, nobody wants to milk cows, it's, it's just been a big issue. They're costing more to keep, and you know, what, what is it going to be five years from now? Um, and then you, know, you start talking about what are the other pressures we're under. We're under a lot of pressure from activists and consumers. Uh, you know, they want to know where their product's coming from. And we, we felt that uh, in, in a robotic a, a VMS environment where it's voluntary, you can tell a better story. And so we had that in, in, in the back of my mind that, you know, uh, you know I would, we were seeing all these activist videos and I'm like, you know, maybe this is kind of activist friendly, you know, that, you know if that's a, a wor <laughs> even possible. Uh, of course, now since then we've had videos from a robot dairy, but uh, we thought this would be tell a better story, uh, giving the cow more freedom, and, and the first thing I noticed when the, the first robot barn that we saw is the cow behavior. How much different cows act in a robot compared to a conventional dairy. And, and watching that transition over the first two weeks when we were starting up cows, it, it was, well, at first it was frustrating, but after they uh, changed, it was pretty neat. But, you know, so we, uh, I think that's um, on the next slide. When we did our startup, There it went. Um, did I? Maybe it's the slide after. Okay. Um, so this was kind of the, the process on when we um, made the decision. We started moving dirt in May of 2016. Oh, and I guess the, the reason we kind of settled on the barn design and the number of robots was, you know, we were, when we were building a rotary, we were going to be building a 3,000 cow dairy. Well, I still wanted to build a 3,000 cow dairy, but one of the other advantages to robots is you can do it in phases. You know, with, when you put in a rotary, you got to get it full as quickly as possible, and we wanted to fill it with our own cattle and kind of do it in phases. We've always done things in, in phases, and that led us to another advantage. So we started um, um, moving dirt in May, concrete June for the, the foundation. Uh, we started putting a roof on in September. And then floors, concrete floors in December, and uh, February 20th of 2017, we started the first six robots, and it took us about two months to get the first 24 running, and so then we, um, you know, just started getting used to it, figuring out how um, how to handle it, and once we saw the performance on the cows, we were like, let's do do some more. Um, so we ended up with with uh, 12 more, so we got 36 running. The, the last set of robots we got running January 8th of this year, so we're still, still new. Um, but we would, uh, when we started, we'd, we'd, 
separate the pens in two, and we'd manually milk them for three days. And, and then uh, after that, that first time, we're like, okay, we're going to let them go. They're going in really good. We're, get, we're milking them every six hours. So you let them go. And then you're like, well, now what? <laughs> so we wait. All right, is anybody going to come? Like, so we, st we start fetching. And what happens is they're used to a conventional parlor. You go find a couple of cows, and everybody gets up and wants to walk to the robot. So it was really hard the first couple of days to get the cows that you wanted. Um, but then slowly they started, they started coming on, in on their own. And by that first week, um, you know, you're, you're fetching in about two robots. And then, and then another, more, another couple of days, you're down to one robot. And then when you go to fetch a cow, the, the, you know, the only the ones that know that it's time to get milked get up. The rest of them, you can walk through the pen. Our fetchers now, you can walk through the pen. The cows don't move. Uh, the pets will find you, uh, which is, which is kind of neat. But just watching that behavior change uh, was really neat. They're, it's, it's quiet. The cows are more relaxed. Um, and uh, we really, really like it. So here we go. Robots versus conventional. I'm going to talk about um, economics, milk production, repro, uh, kind of all that, and then uh, see what, what everybody thinks. So labor, you know, that was one of the reasons why we put in robots. Um, so we're currently running six fetchers a day, three on the day, three at night. Each fetcher is responsible for 12 robots or roughly 720 cows. They are not busy. Um, we, we will probably at some point in time remove two of those. We're still trying to, be, you know, we're still not a mature robot herd, so we still have some constant fetch cows that uh, when they dry off and go to their next lactation, they will not come back to the robots. The fetchers will also uh, calibrate the robots every day. They'll wash the lasers, the 3D cameras. Uh, they're, they're scraping crossovers. They're washing water tanks. Uh, but they're definitely not busy. Uh, the interesting thing was when we started the first set of robots, I asked all my long-term milkers. I'm like, OK, any of you guys want to come, come work at the robots? I had none. I think part of it was they were afraid of what this new position was going to be, and they were really comfortable milking cows. But I did have one employee that had been milking for three or four months. He decided he would try it. And two months after, I asked him, I'm like, so what do you think? He said, easy money. Well, actually, he told that to my manager first. He said, don't tell Brian, but easy money. <laughs> so the guys are definitely, um, uh, definitely a lot more uh, it's, it's easier on them. They're more willing to do the job. Um, but you, they still have to have some sort of responsibility to keep them accountable for, for making sure they're doing what they're supposed to. Uh, so we got two herdsmen there. And, and again, so we're, and the robots were 21, 2200 cows. And I'm comparing this to the double 25 only, which is 18 and 1900 cows. So we got two herdsmen. So the robots will sort out every day. Uh, cows for breeding, cows for pregnancy check, cows for dry off, cows for vaccination, fresh checks. You know, everything you would do is done every day at the robot barn, except for foot trimming. Foot trimming is, is uh, that's a, a circus, but it's, it's really hard to do every day uh, unless you had somebody on farm and that, you know, it's, it's hard to justify one employee just to trim feet for 2,200 cows. So. Uh, foot trimming we're doing once a week. Everything else is done every day. So when the, the herdsmen get there, they start in the first pen, get those cows done. And the first time around, about 80% of the cows they need are there, not 100% not of the cows. So what they used to do is they used to go find them. And I said, stop. I said, why are you spending an hour a day finding cows when the cows can come to you? So what they're doing now is they go through all their pens, have their lunch break, and then they'll come back and then the rest of the cows that they need should be there, then if there's still one that's not, um, they will then go find. But that, that has increased uh, their speed that they can, they can do it that way. So they're doing two rounds, and I've got, I don't know, five, I think five guys on staff that can do pregnancy checks, so that's, that's not an issue. So um, we're doing everything every day. Um, the conventional, um, you know, we got six milkers, and actually most, some of the summer we were running eight trying to, uh, get some, some issues taken care of. But we got two cow pushers, three and a half herdsmen for one for day off. Um, 
And then I don't typically count the scrapers when I'm comparing because it's in the robot barn, it's automatic scrapers. So that's not really a fair comparison, but we do have two scrapers, one pushing cows, one uh, scraping the pen, raking the stalls, um, and, and then we've got one parlor manager. So I, my best estimation, now of course this is comparing a parallel parlor. If you look at a rotary, then maybe the labor difference isn't gonna be huge. Uh, but in our case, I, I, I'm, I'm estimating, I don't have uh, a yearly figure yet, but I'm estimating we're gonna be probably a 30 to 30% 30 reduction. The one other thing in the robot barn is being we've, we're new, we're the biggest, a lot of people, we've got extra guys keeping it clean. So we're, uh, that's something else that we got. Um, Feed costs, I kind of cheated the system a little bit. Um, that was kind of something that scared a lot of people away was the high energy pellet in the robot. Uh, you're gonna increase your feed costs. And uh, so when we were touring, I saw a dairy that was feeding a corn gluten pellet and had been doing it for three years. And when I saw that, I said, that's what I'm doing. I said, no one's gonna, no one's gonna sell me anything because I'm already feeding wet corn gluten in the conventional. And uh, so it was, I, everybody was saying how complicating it can be to feed cows in a robot. And at the, at the bottom line, when it, when it came to starting up, I said, you know what? I'm gonna try it simple and see how it works. So all I did in our diet, I pulled out the wet corn gluten, put a gluten pellet in at the robot, the diet's the same. So there is really no additional feed cost in our, in our robot barn versus our, our conventional dairy. And actually, the more pellet I get the cow to eat, so my high producing cows that get more pellet, that diet is actually gonna be cheaper than in my conventional because the, the gluten pellet is cheaper than my total mixed TMR. Milk production. So this is a graph that compares milk per cow by it's, it's weighted by lactation and by s days of milk. You can see here we've had some dips. That is, an, uh, is when our, we had problems with our, our T4C software, so that is not real. We have been consistently, I would say four to five pounds better, and I think the only reason why we're less than that right now is you can do all the weighting you want but when you have, when you're over 200 days in milk, comparing it to 150 days in milk, it's, it's still not gonna be accurate. So I, I, I think we're closer to probably six pounds better. And then of course, this is just fluid milk. If you were to look at energy corrected milk, right now we're running about two points better butterfat in our robot barn compared to our conventional. Um, so I, I definitely think, and, and how could it not be? Uh, you're, you're not throwing the cow in a holding pen three times a day when it's 90 degrees and 80% humidity. You can soak them all you want. That's still stressful for the cow. And in the robot barn, I will say, so we don't have soakers there. So that, I mean, that even leads to the conventional dairy. We have soakers, fans, the robot barn, just fans. And when it was 90 degrees and humid, the cows got lazy. They didn't want to come to the robot. Milk Milk visits were down. Milk production, yeah, but I think most of it was milk visits. Um, but to still see that advantage, uh, I, I think it's just, there's a, there's a lot to it. Maintenance cost. It's about the only picture I had of somebody doing maintenance, so that, that's the Juno. Um, this is from January 1 to the end of August. This is going to be including chemical and maintenance. And you can see in the robots, we're about $13 per cow per month. And the conventional parlor, we're about $17 per cow per month. Now, that looks like a big number. Is it a fair comparison? Our conventional parlor is 18 years old. The robots are a year old. I don't know. So the, you know, the, the thing that we were told before we started with the robots is your maintenance cost including chemicals should be between seven and $10,000 per robot per year. That number in eight months is about 6,500. So that, puts a, that will put us another three, four months right in that window. 
I think part of the reason why there's that big of a difference, we're doing 90% of the maintenance ourselves on the robots. That's the one thing, uh, one advantage we have is when you have 36 robots, you can learn pretty darn quickly when there's problems and how to fix it. Um, so our two guys on staff that know how to work on robots are almost just as experienced as our, our local dealers because that's all they're doing is working on robots nonstop and it's not this, you know, this and that. And, and so they've gotten really good at, at handling a lot of the problems. And the problems they can't figure out, it's just a phone call and the technician is really good at saying, oh, check this, try this, this is probably what the problem is. Where in the parallel parlor, if there's a problem, you call your dealer, hey, I got this problem, come out and fix it. You know, I don't know how, you know, how much to do there. You know, we will continue uh, uh, running these numbers and, and continue to look at it. We're, we're starting to break things down even better. Um, and you know, the other thing, the first year, a lot of the robot parts were under warranty. So, you know, that's gonna change too as we get, you know, now another year in. But I still think, and my gut is telling me there's probably not gonna be a big difference in maintenance cost and consumables between, between parlors. Um, yeah, I think I touched on, touched on that. Reproduction. Now, I am very disappointed in this overall. I, I really didn't even want to show you guys this because I'm not proud of it at all. Uh, in 2014, our preg rates were 28 to 30% all year round. I have no idea where, what, what happened. I know this is a lot of summer in here, but in all, you know, um, I'm, I'm definitely not happy, but there is still a 5% difference. And you can see conventional dairy, we're doing pre-sync, um, th uh, cherry picking off the second loot shot, cherry picking off the third loot shot, then going to a cedar sink after that, starting to breed at 60 days. Um, in the robots, when we started, there was no off sync even available in the program. And, you know, I'd always wanted to try to reduce, you know, we have these activity monitoring systems. Let's reduce the amount of shots we're given. Let's let the activity monitoring work and let the cow be a cow. So what we're doing there, we'll start breeding at 70 days. By day 78, if she hasn't had a heat, we'll give them a loot shot. And then every two weeks, they'll, f they'll fall in line for a loot shot if they're not cycling. I think the most I've seen is a cow get four loot shots before she actually came into heat. But then we're, we're allowing the heat detection system to work. And you can see we're, you know, about 5% better preg rate. And that's been the number I've heard everywhere is 5%. Um, but hopefully next year it'll be 28 and 32 instead of 17 and 22. But health events. I don't know how well you can see that. Um, so that now this, is, this comparison is going to be from all the conventional cows versus all the robot cows. So the two other dairies, because being the one's first lactation, you want to kind of keep it equal. Um, so we've got the raw numbers here on the left, and we've got our differences here. So we have sold 9% less in the robot barn, about a third of a percent less died. Is that, that's probably not any difference. Uh, DAs actually are just a little bit worse. Again, I think when we've, we've had some issues at times where you get uh, rain, water in your pit when you're unloading pellets and you get some moldy feed. I, you know, I think that could be part of it. And then again, it's not a, it's not a complete TMR, so um, I'm just glad that it's, it's half a percent different. Um, ketosis, let's, that's, that's, that's a false number because in the conventional dairy, we are using AFI lab to find subclinical ketosis. So we're using our fat to protein ratio to find subclinical ketosis. So that's why you see 16.5% there. Having said that, the Laley T4C software will do the same thing. And I have noticed that cows that we freshen into the robots take off better and faster in the robots than they do the conventional. So I don't think that difference is 100% is real, but I still think the fresh cows do better in the robots for some reason. Um, Metritis, you can see, is 7% better. How that is, I, I don't know. Again, is it less stress on the cow? 
you know, the, the one advantage, the cows are all calving in the robot barn, so you walk them into a robot pen versus they get on a trailer and go across the block. Does that, is, does that affect that metritis number? I, I, I don't know. Um, this was kind of surprising. Our pneumonia, 9% more pneumonia in the cross vent barn compared to the natural vent barn. So that obviously just came to my attention as I was pre preparing this for you guys, but that's something that we're going to take notice and we're probably going to need to tweak our ventilation, uh, especially in the wintertime, because you can see the high months down here were February, March, and April, May when it was still cool. So I think, I think we, we have some work to do on our ventilation. But, um, and then RPs, of course, there's a difference of, of 1%. Um, oh, well, I could have done that a long time ago. Uh, what else? Coal rate, one Juno. Uh, that's, that's not funny. Okay. We had uh, our feeder back into the Juno, um, so we, we lost one Juno. 30-day uh, coal rate, and what, what I did is I took out any fresh heifers that were sold um, by dairy, and then anything that ha was sold for, uh, we had some, some heifers sold that were too teated when they calved in, or, or udder, fat udder. So I, I didn't want to take that into consideration in these numbers. So the robots, 3.5%, 30-day coal rate, conventional 5, and 60-day coal rate, 6.5 versus 7. Um, so, so those are the differences in coal rate. Who is the winner? Robot or man? You decide. <laughs> so that, with that, that is my presentation. I'm assuming we've got some time for questions, and I know there's going to be some. So, Just raise your hand, and I'll bring the microphone up. What percentage of your cows are fetch cows? Um, so when I look at the Laley weekly benchmark, I'm running about 12% that get out past 12 hours. Um, so we're fetching four times a day. And I know I'll, everybody tells me that's too much. But what, and essentially what I've done is, because the fetch, you can change in the program how much you want to fetch or how aggressive or relaxed you want to fetch. So I've got it set up fairly relaxed. But then I'm basically, I'm, I'm separating my two fetch periods into four. So instead of trying to fetch 20 cows in a pen twice a day, I'm fetching eight cows in a pen four times a day. Um, right or wrong, I don't know. It seems to be working for us. What frustrates me is, you know, so, so I've been told I've, I overfetch, but what happens, if I've got a, a, a consistent fetch cow, she's really only getting 1.8 milkings a day. And in my eyes, that's not quite enough. Um, so the biggest thing that we're doing is once we get full, and again, this fall, once we start calving them back in, um, if, she's a, if she's a fetch cow, we're taking her back to the conventional dairy where she's fetched three times a day. And that's been something on, on like the fresh heifers. We fetch really aggressively on the fresh heifers for the first 40 days. And then we kind of say, okay, you got to figure it out. Um, but we've had heifers that after 40 days, they become a fetch heifer. And they get 60, 70 days in milk and they're just, they're just, they don't get into peak production. And so we've got some of our heifers that just, they won't reach their potential because they're not getting milked often enough. Uh, so that's something I've told my herdsman that he needs to keep an eye on is if the heifers aren't coming in, you know, at least two and a half times a day by 60 days, let's get them back to the conventional dairy before we, we ruin them because we've, we've done that. Thank you. It, thanks for the presentation, but it, it leads in really well. Uh, how much were you guys picking optimally suited cows for the robot? And, and maybe how much has that impacted a really nice looking set of numbers for your robot barn? And how much back and forthing are you doing? Yeah, I could have cheated, couldn't I? Um, so I, 
I didn't know I was going to give this talk, obviously, but I wanted to know for my own sake if the robots versus the conventional dairy was going to be it. So I, I will say the, the very first startup, I selected uh, maybe 90 cows that were higher genomic milk. So we genetically test everything. And, and then after, the, after that first startup, I'm like, wait a minute, I'm cheating. I can't do that. So after that 90 cows, it was just look at the udder. If she's got a nice udder that can be milked in the robot, she's going to the robot. And, and, so, there, and so like what we're doing uh, every week, the first 16 heifers that calve, starting Monday morning, the first 16 will put four in each pen. The rest of them go to conventional. So there is no sorting. Uh, on, on heifers that are going to the robots versus the conventional. It's, it's blind. It's just the luck of the draw. Minus two cows. I had my daughter's first 4-H calf. She had to go to the robots. And then my favorite that was one of the very first calves we put in the auto feeder. She's the only one that I know of that after one feeding on a day old, a day -old calf, one feeding at, the, at that auto feeder, she came in twice on her own that first night and she just, every three hours, she was going to, the, to that auto feeder getting milk, and we nicknamed her the Beast. <laughs> so I wanted, she was probably one of the very first heifers that we went direct fresh to the robot, because at first we were sending them all to the conventional dairy and then hand-picking back three weeks later, which why it took me six months to figure this, this was probably not the right move, I don't know, because when we built the auto feeders, that was my argument the whole time is, why are we backgrounding calves? What's the difference if you take the calf to the bottle or the bottle to the calf? And so we never backgrounded calves. We always put them on the feeder day one. And why I couldn't think the same way in, in the robot, was, and when I finally did six months later, I'm like, you stupid person. Anyway, um, it's, the similarities are there. But uh, so yeah, we're, we're, we're not, udder is the only thing we're looking at for um, cows going into the robots. Now, like I said earlier, uh, we've got some room in the robots, so the only cows, mature cows that I'm putting in the robot now that wouldn't have been in the robot before is if she was fed in that auto feeder barn. Uh, thank you, great presentation. Uh, do you see improved cash flows from the robot barn to the conventional? <laughs> Um, you, you got to have positive cash flow before you can see, a, a, you know, cash flow difference. But um, that's something. So we just hired a new um, office manager type person that in the last three weeks we're really starting to dig down and all the expenses we're going to compare, you know, by site, by location, by robot. Um, to me, with the numbers that I've showed you, it's, it's pretty obvious that it's got to be. Um, you know, we've reduced our labor. We're getting more milk per cow, uh, better components. We're culling less, better repro. Uh, uh, of course, it's, it's, it's got to lead to better cash flow. Thank you for the presentation. My name is Virpi Kurkela. I uh, come from 4D Barn uh, Company. I wanted to ask you, have you ever calculated how many pounds of milk you get per labor hour? And is that some kind of figure you would be interested to know? Th that's um, not something I've done yet. That's what we're trying to get to that level, uh, to see exactly uh, what that is. Um, but uh, like I said, you know, we're it's, it's still kind of in, in the learning phase on how to be the best, man, you know, how to manage it the best and the leanest with, you know, the least amount of, of labor. Um, and I don't think we're there yet. I think, I think once we, we need to get two more fetchers out, out, of the, out, of the scenario, out of the picture. You know, the problem, my idea when we went from 24 to 36, my idea was we're not going to add any more fetchers. Well, what happens? You got, you got a robot startup. You got 180 or 300, I think, what, what are we, 250 to 300 cows you bring in all at once that don't know the first thing about robot. How can you have less labor? So then all of a sudden you got, oh, well, we got to hire a couple guys to help get these cows trained. Well, then the first two weeks, you know, you got half of them are fetch cows, but then you get your, your employees that are already there, they need to go fetch the cows that are already there. 
And so that's how we ended up, well, we, well, we got to have an extra person to fetch these cows until we get them trained. Well, then they get, everybody gets comfortable in that and you don't let anybody go, you know. So it's, it's, it's you know, it just keeps dragging on and on and on. And, and I think, uh, you know, we finally, you know, and we were, and I don't know how, you know, your guys' situation was, but we always used to keep one to two extra employees on hand because by the, t by the time you get them trained, somebody else is leaving. Well, then all of a sudden in June or July, that stopped. So all of a sudden we have two extra guys and, and like we got to find work for them. And you don't want to fire them because you don't know when somebody else is leaving. I mean, we, it was probably the first time in, in three years that we went a month with the same labor force. And we were just shocked. And now finally we've, we've had a couple of guys leave, but we have not added any employees. So I think it get, it'll get to that point when we have a couple more guys leave, then we're going to be, hey, fetchers, sorry, but you got you know, another six robots to fetch. I was wondering, does the offset of the labor pay for the robots? When you buy 36 of them, you bet your ass it does. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, uh, you know, we, we looked at that and, you know, we were trying to figure out, okay, well, you, know, how, you know, how do you pay for it? You know, how long of an amortization do you want? Um, you know, I think, um, I think it definitely does. I mean, when you talk about six, eight pounds more milk, over a lactation, you know, a day, you multiply that over, you know, a lactation, uh, it's, it does. I mean, yes, this was a huge investment for us. Uh, it's the biggest step we've ever taken. I think we missed on our timing a little bit. Um, and, and so, you know, we're in the same boat as everybody else. Obviously, you, you saw my repro numbers. We're not perfect. We have issues. Um, and, and we're struggling just like everybody else. Um, but once things start turning around a little bit and, and we get a, a mature robot herd, uh, I think w we've definitely uh, have ourselves geared up to be competitive with almost anybody. The one thing I picked up today that I never really thought about, you can walk in any robot facility and you can just feel a different vibe from the cow comfort and just calmness. But the thing he brought up today is maybe works on the labor side too, right? That you might be able to retain employees better because it's a better environment for them too. So long term, there's probably some benefits there too. Do you compensate the uh, employees in a robot barn different than in a conventional? Nope. They start at the same rate, whether they're going to the robots or conventional. Now what I've learned, you can't start somebody out in the robot barn and then move them over to the conventional. They're just going to leave. <laughs> so what I'm trying to do is any new employee, they start at the conventional dairy first, and then if there's a position at the robot barn, then, then they'll move. But that's, uh, we're going to test that theory one more time here, and I think the next week or two where we've got one person in the robots, we're going to try to move to the conventional. We're all expecting him to leave. You mentioned using the activity monitors more for heat detection. Are you guys using those any differently between the conventional and the robotic? And are you also using the activity monitoring systems to determine uh, transition health events or um, the amount? Do you see that decreasing or in helping with labor at all as well? So there's like three questions there. Um, <clears throat> so the activity. We, we've had many discussions over the last six months on, you know, because in the conventional dairy, you got, you know, Monday is your heavy breeding day because you do all your loot shots on Friday. Tuesday's vet check day. Wednesday's dry off. Thursday, you move fresh cows. So, it's like, every day you got something, in it, and you know, some days are better than others. Weekends, there's, like, nothing to do. So, we're like, hmm, should we just do like we do in the robots and do everything every day so every day's the same? And... We've talked about it. Everybody was like, yeah, we could try it, but then we never implemented it. So we are still doing stuff different um, in the conventional than the robots. The activity monitoring, uh, the one thing, you know, in the conventional dairy, we're tail chalking along with using the activity monitoring system. And the robots, when you have no headlocks, there's no tail chalking. So it's only the activity monitoring system. 
Um, the systems are going to be a little bit different because in the robots, you got the SCR with rumination. Uh, the AFI farm, you don't have rumination, but you also have, you know, it's a, it's a different program. So when you're looking at, I guess, to your next question, fresh cow performance and ketosis, um, you know, AFI, we're using, you know, the fat to protein ratio mostly with, mil you know, milk production. If they're not increasing, there's a problem. Uh, the the Laley software has a similar thing. It's using fat to protein ratio, uh, milk per hour. Um, you know the one thing that that does. You know both programs have conductivity. Um, the robots will detect mastitis, um, and and it, you know it's they do the same things just a little bit differently. And so uh, you got to have guys that are somewhat computer savvy. That especially your your herdsmen and managers so they can learn new softwares and how to use them, but it hasn't really been much of a challenge. Did I answer all three of your questions? Okay. We got time for a couple more, go ahead. Are you guys uh, free flow or force flow for your feeding? Uh, completely free flow. Okay, so, that's, so now I have a follow-up question. Um, I can think of people who would give me their firstborn child before they will go to a free flow because they are just stuck on force flow. I have not been able to effectively help them change that. Can you give me some tips? Because I have one client, like for three years, I feel like I have failed to get him to switch from force flow, and I think it's costing him milk, and I can't get him to change. Yeah, I, I mean, the numbers are there. I, I, I guess I, you know, there was, you still, in the free flow, we still have, so we have, um, so we have gates that we can close to make a set or a, kind of a fetch pin in front of the first robot and the last robot. So we're free flow, but then like your fresh heifers, you'll put them in a little fetch pin and then your fetch cows. So you're, you're, you're always going to fetch cows. So whether, and that was kind of my argument from the beginning, you're going to fetch cows, whether it's 6%, 8%, 10%, does it really matter? You're still in the pen fetching cows and it's not hard. Uh, the guys are, have had no problems finding cow, you know, one or two cows out of 180. It's, it's, it's not a big deal. So to me, there's, if you're, if you're going to do the guided flow, it's more gating and more possible problems for bottlenecking. Uh, you know, we went to one, one dairy that was a, a guided flow. The robots were washing and the fetch pen was completely full. So you've got 16 cows in their, in their commitment pen and they're all going to be there for at least two hours and they can't go anywhere. Where, so uh, that, that scared me away from a guided flow right away is, is just that, is you lock those cows up and they can't go anywhere until they go through the robot. And, um, and the free flow, it, it, I don't know, I know it scared me at first. It's like, boy, are they really going to come in on their own? But they do. You know, they want to get milk too. So, uh, yeah, to me, I, you know, I don't know if that's a good argument, but uh, I don't see why. Why not let the cow decide whatever she wants to do? How is your uh, milk quality on both convention and robot and the type of bedding at both locations? And also, was there money issues to get the robot farm on grade A? Um, there was not really any issues getting at grade A. Um, fortunately for me, there was another farm not too far away from me that put in 12 before we did. Uh, so he had more of the, the issues. So we worked with our, our, you know, inspector through the entire process. So they, they knew what was going on. They saw the plans and they got their input. Um, so, so that was that was good. We, you know, we worked through. So that was not a problem. Um, milk quality has has been surprise. You know, surprising. Early on, we were um, somatic cell was lower in the robots. Um, so the, earlier this spring, uh, the robot barn in our, our other barn that was 13 miles away, our somatic cell was 180,000 on uh, green manure solids from the robot barn. Uh, the main dairy. We were using digested solids off of roller presses. It was too wet. We had mastitis issues. We had somatic cell issues. So we made the decision, hey, let's take the dry air bedding, green bedding, and bed everything with it. Well, 
Then all of a sudden when you have an inventory, your barn's full of manure and all of a sudden your inventory goes to nothing, everything, all three farms just exploded. Somatic cell over 300,000, 4% mastitis. And we're just like, oh my gosh, what did we do? Um, so we've had lots of issues this year with that. Um, I'm looking at a manure dryer to solve that, that problem because we really want to work, uh, we want manure solids to work. Um, but we, we definitely had some issues. Uh, overall, I like it better. Uh, the robots, you, they're, they're never going to milk a three-quartered cow. If you get it programmed into the robot, it's never, she's not going to lose her band and the employee's going to forget and put, put the cup on. If it detects abnormal milk, it dumps it down the drain. Um, it just, it's better. So, I mean, we've had some issues, but I think overall, uh, milk quality has been less of a problem at the robots than the conventional. But again, it's new, it's brand new, so. All right, I think we're out of time. I'm sure Brian will stick around for a couple minutes if you have further questions. Thanks, Brian. Yep. And great job, we appreciate it. <laughs> One last thing, Sarah had handed out some surveys. If you can, please take a minute to fill out the survey and you can leave it on the desk outside the door on your way out, so thanks for coming.